basis, and, and uh, we are pleased to, to have you here. Uh, uh, a few things that I will mention is the society is going to be having a uh, book sale. We have a massive inventory of books for sale. I mean, a massive inventory of books for sale. Uh, some of them we have 800 copies that we need to get rid of. So uh, be on the lookout for that. Uh, some great things to fill out your personal library, but uh, they, they need to be on your shelf and not our shelf. And uh, next month, on the 27th, we will be uh, having sort of a field trip meeting for a tour of uh, Morrison Park and the restoration work that's been going on there for the last several years. That will be at 6 o'clock. That will also be our annual meeting and our election of officers uh, for the coming year. And, uh, and I would remind those of you who are uh, board members of the society that we'll have a board meeting next Tuesday at 5 o'clock in the uh, small meeting room at the library. Uh, tonight we have a treat. Uh, we, we just keep having treats out of the Hughes household. Uh, we had Susan come earlier this year and present her program about uh, uh, the alleged slave quilts and underground railroad quilts and that sort of thing. That was a fascinating program. Tonight we are pleased that we have uh, her sidekick, uh, Nikki Hughes. Uh, Nikki is the former curator of the Kentucky Military History Museum and many other uh, interesting things over the years, quite the reenactor. And uh, they have retired, lucky for us, to Franklin, Kentucky. And uh, we can now have access to to, uh, to help us uh, enjoy more of our own history. Uh, tonight, uh, Nikki is going to uh, be sharing his uh, program, uh, Kentucky versus the Flying Saucers. And so uh, I think it'll be fascinating. A lot of people have been asking questions about what it's really about, so we'll find out. Thank you. Uh, can we kill lights? Well, I've got some fine print to read. We'll see how this goes. A uh, couple of government agencies, uh, NASA and uh, the Air Force in particular, have recently shown a lot more interest in what we've always called UFOs. And maybe that accounts for how you can get a room full of people to come to a historical society meeting in Glasgow, Kentucky, that's entitled Kentucky versus the UF versus the Flying Saucers. Uh, I think there's a, a lot of interest in this once again. It kind of comes and goes. And there's always a great mystery surrounding flying saucers and UFOs. Oh, and by the way, we've now changed the uh, uh, terminology for that. What is it they're calling them now? Uh, unidentified aerial phenomena. They are now UAPs. Uh, but a, as a creature of habit, I'll probably use the term UFO all the way through this. Um, this is an episode. This really, really happened. Lots of uh, UFO and flying saucer stories are uh, little green men stories or more or less fanciful. Uh, I think a lot of them uh, come out of the bottom of a bourbon barrel, but that's a whole other story. Um, but this one is absolutely real. The basic facts are true. This did happen. Uh, but exactly what happened is, is what the big debate has been about ever since this episode happened back in 1948. This is the story of a uh, officer in the U.S. Army Air Corps and then in the Kentucky Air National Guard, uh, Captain Thomas Mantell. There he is. And we're going backwards. Um, this episode takes place in 1947-1948 and it begins in the era when flying saucers were a new phenomenon. Uh, there was a gentleman named Kenneth Arnold who uh, reported seeing some objects flying near where he was flying out, out west on the west coast. 
that he couldn't identify, didn't know what they were. He got a lot of publicity on this. Curiously, he never used the word flying saucers, never used that phrase. Uh, he said that the things he saw going through the sky that he couldn't identify skipped through the air as if you had thrown a saucer into a body of water. And that got pretty much simplified in the press as flying saucer. Uh, his name was, was Kenneth Arnold. He was a commercial pilot, was in the air a lot. And he uh, stuck with this story for the rest of his life. And the story took off. It was hugely, huge amount of public interest all over the United States through the rest of the 1940s and into the 1950s. Uh, most of it generated, or at least started, by his account of these flying saucers. Although, again, he didn't really ever use that term. Um, that's what he said he actually saw. See the crescent-shaped uh, object in the artist's rendition there? He said he saw several of those things flying along uh, across his path as he was uh, in his plane out in, in Washington, over Washington State. Uh, he stayed on that story, stayed with his story with very little variation for the rest of his life, and it continued to be just a fascinating tale for lots and lots of people. Still is. And uh, in the late 40s and in the 50s, there came an enormous flying saucer phenomenon. Uh, articles, movies, science fiction movies, documentary movies, uh, all manner of, of public attention. Newspapers paid a lot of attention to this. What are these things? Where are they coming from? Great mystery attached to them. A lot of people didn't, at least originally, didn't take it terribly seriously, but a lot of people did find it interesting. What are they? Well, this is the gentleman uh, we're going to talk about again. This is Captain Mantell. Ironically, he was born in Franklin, Kentucky, and he died in Franklin, Kentucky, or very nearly in Franklin, Kentucky, but he never lived there. Uh, his parents were passing through Franklin in 1922, and Mother Nature declared, you're going to have the kid now. So uh, they had the baby in the uh, hospital there in, in Franklin. And uh, he would ultimately meet his death just outside of Franklin. Um, he lived most of his life in Louisville at 104 North 33rd Street. His wife was named Peggy. Uh, after they got married, they bought a house at 3533 River Park Drive. He went to Bale High School, and his first job was working at what we would later know as the, the Naval Ordnance Station in Louisville. Um, he worked uh, for Westinghouse as well as a machinist. And like a lot of other young men, he joined the Army Air Corps in 1942, on uh, June the 16th to be exact. Uh, and I found out that a lot of his compatriots in the Air Corps had a nickname for him. They called him Shiny because they said he was always so neat, so trim, so clean, just the perfect soldier. They, uh, they said he was just shiny. Get the escape. Um, what he did, uh, he went to uh, training in Mariana, Florida, and he flew C-47 cargo planes during the Second World War. During the war, he put in 2,167 flying hours, most of it with the 96th Truth, Truth Carrier Squadron. And what he did was a particularly perilous undertaking. He towed gliders. Uh, several of the military forces in World War II developed uh, unpowered gliders, big ones, that were pulled behind other airplanes to a target area. They were full of soldiers, full of equipment. When they got to the target area, the uh, towing plane would cut the cable uh, or release the cable, and the glider would glide down and make a landing, and in theory, all the soldiers would leap out and carry the war to the enemy. 
it was an incredibly perilous way to fight your war. This is uh, one, there were two main types in American service. This is one of them. And if you want to see one of these, you can. They have one at the 101st Airborne Division uh, Museum over at Fort Campbell. And if you want to go through the post 9-11 security <laughs> clearances uh, to get into that museum, all the boats and see that museum, they have one of these things. And you go on it, and it's just metal tubing covered in canvas. Enormous courage to uh, climb into one of these things. Even if nobody's trying to shoot you out of the sky, it's still a perilous way to go anywhere and do anything. Um, Captain Mantell made several flights towing gliders. He was one of the first ones uh, over Normandy on D-Day. But his real moment of glory, <laughs> probably a little more terror than glory to his perspective, was in the episode shown here. This is his plane after he came back from uh, the market garden operation over Holland. Uh, it was torn all to heck by German anti-aircraft fire. It returned, he flew it back to base after flying on to the place where he was supposed to release his glider. He could have dropped him anywhere and headed for base, but he didn't. He flew to his C-47, towing the glider to the place they were supposed to be, turned them loose. Only then did he fly back to base. He made it back, back to his base uh, safely. The uh, controls were pretty much chewed up by any aircraft fire. Tail was on fire when he came in for a landing. Uh, he apparently had kind of a little bit of a dark sense of humor because the name of his airplane was Vulture's Delight. But the Vulture's didn't win. Not this time, anyway. For his work as an aviator in the Second World War, he won one of these, a Distinguished Flying Cross, and uh, the Air Medal with uh, three oak leaf clusters, seven battle stars. Uh, after the uh, market garden operation, and after he got the Distinguished Service Cross, he was brought back to the United States, spent the rest of the war doing uh, war bonds <coughs> drives. Um, and he joined the uh, Kentucky Air National Guard. After the Second World War, the Defense Department was established, a separate Air Force was set up, and lots of states received, uh, they didn't have just an Army National Guard detachment, they also had Air National Guard set up. And he was one of the early recruits to the Kentucky Air National Guard. And initially they flew uh, F-51 Mustang fighter planes. Now, I no doubt there's some airplane geeks here who are now saying it's P-51. Ah, when they established the Air Force, they changed the designations on the, uh, the fighter planes. They have been P for pursuit. When the Air Force was established and the Air National Guard was established, they changed it to F for fighter. So the P-51 became the F-51. And I'll probably use both terms in the course of, of this. Um, it was pretty natural that he would be, uh, that he would join the Air National Guard because apparently flying was just a, an important part of, of Mantell's life. This was the plane that he flew, or that he flew after the war. This is how it appeared during the Second World War. This particular airplane went uh, had a lot of service in Europe during the Second World War and was brought back to the United States and was one of the planes issued to the Kentucky Air National Guard um, and it got a paint job, changed in numbers, but this is, this is the plane that he used. Um, there's an account of when the Kentucky Air National Guard received their F-51 Mustangs, the uh, Air Force just flew them in to the airfield in Louisville one day, didn't tell anybody <coughs> they were coming, 
and suddenly 20 F-51 Mustang fighter planes appear on the horizon, come roaring in, land on the runway, pull off on the tarmac, the pilots get out, jump on a bus, disappear. There's your airplanes, guys, have fun. They said it was a little noisy, too. The uh, F-51 was, was still pretty hot stuff in 1947, 1948. It had been one of the most successful uh, American fighter aircraft in the Second World War. In fact, one of the most successful aircraft of the Second World War. And it would remain in service into the 1950s, long after jets became the standard fighter planes all over the world. Uh, here's Mantell with one of his sons. He was quite a family man, and frankly, Russell, this guy's kind of frustrating he, <laughs> for historians. I can't find a cross word ever written or said about him. You know, nobody's perfect, but this guy really was just shiny. Everybody seemed to like him. Uh, he always seemed to do his job at the right place at the right time. And uh, he still has family descendants in Louisville, and they are uh, very, very fond of him to this day. Uh, here's a shot of him. I don't know if this is in Mexico or Texas. I got a feeling it's in Texas, but he's the guy on, on our right, smiling rather broadly. Looks kind of shiny there, doesn't he? He uh, went into business at Bowman Field, and let me find, I got a couple of oops, ads that he ran in the Louisville papers advertising his business. Um, one of them said, flight training for veterans, government expense, metal, Cessna trainers, Elkins Mantel flight training, and uh, then a phone number. He also ran a second ad, which is kind of distinctive to that time and place. It said colored veterans, separate ad, colored veterans, learn to, to fly and get compensation, pay under your compensation pay under your GI Bill of Rights, no cost to you. Starting colored school, phone 111-7116, Elkins Mantel Flight Training, mm -hmm. Administration Building, Bowman Field. This is the administration building at Bowman where that operation was headquartered. Um, the episode in which we are interested begins at the Marietta Army Air Force Base in Georgia. And uh, Russell, I hope you appreciate the picture of the P-47. Uh, by the way, Russell Harris, old, 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 old friend of mine, uh, they built P-47 fighter planes in uh, Evansville, Indiana, just down the road from here. And uh, in the Second World War, his mother, who would later be a great English teacher, her job was to jump in the cockpit, crank everything up, and make sure it all worked. Which had to be great fun, I think. <laughs> uh, but the P-47 has absolutely nothing to do with this story. You go out and try to find a photograph of this of Marietta Army Air Force Base in 1947. This is the best I can do, folks. Uh, Mantell and three other pilots, four planes, four men all together, were on a training mission in, uh, to Marietta, Georgia and back. They did this sort of thing all the time. It was just to put in hours, uh, get better at flying your airplane, learn more about your airplane. They had been to Marietta on one of these flights and were on their way back to Kentucky when these gentlemen become involved. The Kentucky Highway Patrol starts receiving phone calls from people who were seeing a strange object in the air. And all sorts of different descriptions of what it looked like, how it was moving, where it was had come from, where it was going. Basically, most of them said they were seeing, people were seeing a flaming red cone. This had started over Ohio and came all the way across into western Kentucky, including Madisonville and Owensburg. And some of them described a rotating inverted ice cream cone, is what they were seeing flying across the sky. Uh, these calls started coming in about 2.30 in the afternoon. Well, the Kentucky State, or Kentucky Highway Patrol, not being very good at this sort of thing, nobody else was either, 
they called up uh, the logical place, which was the control tower at Godwin Field, which is the air base uh, at Fort Knox, and told them what was going on and said, could you please maybe find out what this is about? Two of the men who were, another picture of the field, still there, uh, who were in the tower that day were these two gentlemen, Sergeant Blackwell, the one on the left with the binoculars, and the man in command that afternoon was this, was the other fellow, Colonel Hicks. Uh, Mantell and his flight were on their way back to Kentucky, and this is a photo of uh, Mantell and, and his comrades, probably the same planes and the same pilots that were in uh, the UFO episode, and the plane in the closest with the 869 number, uh, that's Captain Mantell uh, in his plane, almost it's certainly his plane, and I'm pretty sure he's in it. So uh, the uh, men at Godman Field called up Mantell as they're flying north out of Georgia back towards Stanford Field in Louisville. Said, would you go check out this funny looking thing that has appeared in the sky? Uh, two of the other pilots who were with him were these two fellows, uh, Lieutenants Clemens and Hammond. The fourth fellow uh, didn't participate in the following events. Uh, he had a problem with his plane, probably I think he was just low on fuel. And when these all three, uh, Mantell, Clemens, and Hammond, uh, diverted their flight paths to go look at whatever this strange <coughs> thing was, uh, the fourth guy flew on to Louisville and didn't take part in all of this. <coughs> Let's see if I can read in the dark. There isn't, oh, and this is uh, uh, where Mantell and the other fellows were operating out of uh, Stanford Field as it looked in 1947, 1948. A little bit different from now. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, They, uh, they flew higher and higher and higher, uh, kept ascending. Uh, they could see something. It wasn't anything they were familiar with, couldn't really identify it, but they kept going up and up and up, uh, looking, trying to close in on this thing. Um, there was a problem in that only one of the planes was equipped uh, with a functional oxygen system, and it wasn't Mantell's. Um, this was essential at the altitudes they were getting to. Two of the men broke off the, the, uh, the, the quest looking for this flying object at about 22,500 feet up, which is good, pretty good for a P-51, F-51. This is the flight path they took. Uh, you see they come up from Marietta, cross Tennessee, one goes straight back to Louisville, two turn and with Mantell follow the UFO for a while, then two of them turn and he sends them back to Stanford, to Louisville. There uh, isn't actually a transcript of the communications between the tower and the airplanes, but there were some pretty good notes taken uh, and a report made afterward. Um, supposedly, at one point, Mantell radioed in and said, the object is directly ahead of and above me now, moving about half my speed. It appears to be a metallic object or possibly a reflection of sun from a metallic object. And it is of tremendous size. I'm still climbing. I'm trying to close in for a better look.
um, finally, he quit communicating. And um, at this point is where the mystery comes in. We don't know what happened to his plane or to him exactly <coughs> at this point. By this time, they were over Simpson County, over Franklin. Uh, Mantell was alone, somewhere over 22,000 feet, chasing, chasing this thing in the sky. His other comrades had turned and headed toward the Stanford Field. Um, all we know was that something was happening over Franklin. This is a picture of Franklin about 1948, as close as I could get. And a scene pretty much like this was going on in the sky above the town. And still he climbed, still he climbed. We think there, uh, it was the simplest explanation of what happened is that he simply flew higher than the airplane, higher than its operational ceiling. Uh, this is the Packard Merlin V-12 aircraft engine, which was a fabulous engine, as what was in that, that F-51. But even it's got to have air to breathe. And certainly the pilot has to have air to breathe. The most likely explanation of what happened is that he was chasing this unidentified thing and uh, lost consciousness. That's the most rational explanation. In any event, the airplane fell out of the sky and crashed uh, in rural Simpson County, just southwest of Franklin. His watch stopped at 3.18 p.m. And uh, the thing that he had been chasing by 3.50 had completely disappeared. Nobody, the people who got them, at Fort Knox couldn't see it, nobody here saw it either. This is the, the crash site. Uh, I'd love to identify some of these people, and some of them have been identified. And in fact, there was a meeting of the Simpson County Historical Society a few months back where they brought in some eyewitnesses, uh, people who were about 80 uh, who had been little kids and remembered uh, this, this had fallen on the family farm or their neighbor's, neighbor's farm. They had very vivid memories of the episode. And a huge crowd showed up here. Uh, apparently it was about the biggest traffic jam ever in the history of Simpson County. That's probably not saying much. It's <laughs> another, another view of it. And again, apparently what happened was as the plane came down in a spin at an altitude uh, not all that high uh, above the Simpson County farmland it was headed for, it came apart, came to pieces. The eyewitnesses uh, remembered hearing lots of pieces hitting the roof of the house. And that's exactly what would happen if a plane disintegrated right up there just before it hit the ground. It disintegrated with a loud booming noise that would heard, was heard for a long distance around. And lots of people saw this all over, uh, all over the county. Uh, in testament to the violence with which the airplane came apart, the tail separated from the main body of the plane and was found later quite a few yards away from where the main body of the plane was. Um, the extent of the debris field, there are wildly varying accounts of how widely scattered the debris was. Um, but there's no doubt that the airplane broke up just before it, it hit the ground. Well, this made all the papers. This was the photograph, sorry for the quality of it, uh, in the, the Courier Journal. Uh, the next day, uh, the, they quoted the Air National Guard operations officer at Stanford Field saying that the pilot blacked out for lack of oxygen. This is 
is where it happened. One of these fields down, this is Franklin, and it was right down here. Um, anybody here from Simpson County? You know where Lake Spring Church is? Yeah. Yep. Well, they just go right down the road and it's on the right through a, through a real thick tree line. It's sort of hard to see it over if it's just a part of barn lot. Uh, it's not by, tell it's not by, it's a two uh, Cracker Barrel. Yeah, it's, <laughs> Susan said, it's behind Cracker Barrel off exit two. <laughs> uh, Lake Spring Church is the nearest landmark and it's behind that uh, tree line there. This is beautiful farm country, uh, almost in Tennessee. It's just gorgeous countryside out there. And he's right in there, right behind that uh, row of trees. In this barn lot, the house wasn't there at the time. I'm not sure that barn was either, but there was a house right there. Um, the local authorities responded immediately to this. It was a very unusual event. The local coroner went out and removed Mantell's body, and it was taken, taken to Franklin. This was a drawing that was done at the time of the crash site, the main body of the plane here. The left wing was thrown over here. This is the farmer's house. And there's uh, some uh, sort of unfortunate notation here, part of skull and scalp. And then the uh, canopy of the plane had been blown completely off. On parts of the wreckage went up to the top right. The tail was found several yards back up to the top right. Uh, the tail, by the way, uh, stayed when when the army, when the air force came to pick up the remains of the airplane. They missed it. They didn't get it. Somebody found it a few weeks later, and it stayed in Franklin for a long time. In 1956, it was presented to the Kentucky Museum at Western. Nobody knows where it is now. <laughs> I'd love to find that. Uh, the uh, Simpson County Historical Society, their museum, has a, a piece of the airplane, a little piece of aluminum that somebody found in the way of the crash. This is a very colorful character, uh, Bill Horn. At the time, he was constable. Uh, later, he would become Simpson County Jailer. And I remember him distinctly. He was a gruff, cantankerous, fellow with an incredibly colorful language, uh, useful language. Uh, I was talking to the gentleman who was a judge during his term as jailer, and he said for every court session, Bill would escort the prisoners from the Simpson County Jail, which is a huge medieval looking pile of stone, uh, across the street to the county courthouse. And the judge said he could always tell if these prisoners were okay or if they were really rough guys. If they were just kind of okay, Bill would be escorting them carrying a pistol. If they were rather more unpleasant, Bill came with a shotgun. <laughs> I said he never allowed that to prejudice his, uh, <coughs> his findings in their cases though. Anyway, uh, at, that, at this point he was a, a constable and he was the fellow who was entrusted with taking care of the wreckage of the airplane. They handled things rather more casually in those days than, than we would now, I think. Mantell, his remains were buried in Louisville at uh, uh, the Reef Cemetery. He's Zachary Taylor. Yeah. And then the newspapers took off. Uh, starting first with the Franklin favorite, the local, the local newspaper, of course. They covered it very thoroughly, and were pretty much accurate, I think, in what, what they reported on it. 
and this was picked up in newspapers all over the country. Uh, the Louisville Courier Journal ran with it big time. There we go. And the term flying saucer has already been introduced into the story. This is in some Spanish speaking place. I have no idea where. And this is really cool. In 1952, uh, Life magazine did an article, an in depth piece, as in depth as, as Life got, uh, about the flying saucers. And it talked a lot about the Mantell episode here in, in Kentucky. So what it turns out is that Franklin, Kentucky ended up in a copy of Life Magazine, an edition of Life Magazine that had Marilyn Monroe on the front cover. I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> True Magazine. Anybody remember True? This is one of those magazines that our mothers weren't really sure we needed to have in the house. Anyway, they did an in-depth article and they uh, talk a lot about the Mantell episode, and they used it as evidence that uh, the flying saucers are real, they're from another planet, and they are hostile. Uh, I've read that article, and there's a lot of just plain silly factual errors in it. This, I recommend to you, in 1956, the movie UFO was made, and it's almost a documentary. It takes several of the early, more prominent uh, UFO flying saucer episodes and does dramatizations of them. And the portrayal of the Mantell episode is not bad at all. Uh, it's on YouTube. Uh, I recommend take, take a look at it. They look, the, uh, and I, I think the posters were about it were well, kind of like my title to this, this presentation. <laughs> uh, they were designed really to, to, to sucker people in. Now, what was he chasing? At first, the Air Force declared that he was chasing the planet Venus. Well, nobody knows. <laughs> but you're, 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 we're still laughing about it over half a century later. You know, Nobody really fell for that one. And, uh, and that, that would fell by the wayside pretty quickly. Uh, so, what was it? Probably looked something like that. That's what they've been describing, wasn't it? This is probably, I think, a reasonable explanation for what he was chasing. At that point, the, uh, the Skyhook high altitude research balloons. Uh, our versions of spy balloons too, although they did a lot of scientific upper atmosphere research, were just being introduced. And they were completely secret. Uh, they would go public, obviously here, uh, shortly thereafter, in 1948, shortly after the Mantell incident. But at the time he was flying, making this flight, there was no way that Thomas Mantell could have known about these balloons. This is what they look like. They, uh, they're interested in how they get bigger and bigger and bigger the higher they go, because less pressure from the atmosphere, the gas that's lifting them can expand. So they become huge as, as they ascend. And that's what they look like when they get at their operational attitude. And of course, there's no way you're ever going to, in a P-51, you're ever going to fly high enough to catch up with one of these things. It will always appear to be eluding you. Now, you may have observed that I'm a bit of a skeptic about uh, UFOs and flying saucers. I will now tell you why. Uh, we looked at this scene in Franklin in 1948 a few minutes ago. This is the same scene some 20 years later in 1968. 
At which point, there was a report of flying saucers over Simpson County again. They were described as rotating lights of various colors. It was at night and uh, making humming noises, all sorts of vivid descriptions of what these things looked like. Russell's smiling at me with good, good reason. Uh, what they were was this. Uh, they were homemade, unidentified flying objects. What you could do is you take two plastic soda straws, tape them together in an X with uh, scotch tape, tape 12 birthday cake candles to them, then glue or tape that assembly under the bottom of a plastic dry cleaner bag, having taped shut the hole at the top where the uh, hanger hook goes through. You light these candles on a dark, windless night, use some candles off your mother's dining table to uh, superheat the air in the balloon, and off it goes, floating silently across the sky, responding to the wind, uh, very alien-looking device. How do I know? Because I did it. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I was, uh, my, my wife for many years ran the Kentucky Junior Historians Program, Young Historians Program for the Kentucky Historical Society. And I was an officer in that in high school. And I went to a meeting at uh, Bardstown one day. Remember the Holiday Inn that used to sit by the uh, parkway up there? And uh, back then there was a magazine rack in the lobby. Remember magazine racks? For that matter. And uh, I saw this magazine, this special edition of Look, while I was waiting for the meeting to start. And as I flipped through, there's a long article that tells you how to make your own UFO. So, what do I do? I come home, recruit some of my best friends, and uh, this photo is us as portrayed in the Franklin Favorite, the local newspaper, a few days later. We, we launched one of these things. Russell, were you involved in this? Uh, <laughs> and uh, we flew one of these the first night we did it, and off it went across Franklin. And we hopped into one of my friends, uh, 58 Buick, I think it was, and here we take off following this thing across town. Back then, people sat on their front porches and in their front lawns, and this is the middle of the summer, and as we roared down the streets, there were people everywhere standing, <laughs> following this thing across the sky. And uh, we thought this was really great, as you, as you might imagine. Uh, we finally, we get to an intersection at the edge of town, a T intersection. Uh, we pull up, stop, and over a little rise here comes half the Franklin Police Department, one car carrying two officers. <laughs> And one of the officers is hanging out the window with a drawn pistol. <laughs> At this point, we decide maybe we better call off our pursuit here. And we went back to one of the fellows' houses where we launched this thing. Uh, fortunately, it flew right over what was then the city dump. And how these things work, as the candles burn down, they will eventually get to that uh, scotch tape that holds everything together, and it goes up uh, poof and sparks the flame. And that happened, fortunately, this one did that right over the city dump, which back in those days was had fires burning in it anyway, and it fell in the dump, absolutely unrecognizable, un uncovered. <laughs> so being good citizens, we went back to the house where we launched this thing. We said, we better call the police department about this. So one of the guys uh, phoned up the Franklin Police Department and reported a UFO, and the uh, uh, fellow at the desk says, it's real this time. This is the real thing. He said, now stay calm, it'll be all right. We know all about it, but this is the real, the real thing. Well, uh, we didn't, weren't able to keep the secret very long, as you can imagine, a bunch of kids in high school. And there are still people in Franklin who look at me kind of sideways from our role in this. Uh, I was I developed a healthy skepticism about UFOs. If you could see a plastic bag and birthday cake candles, uh, and if you could see that as rotating, multicolored lights, making buzzing noises, 
you can say whatever it is you want to say. Now, interestingly enough, we did this again in Lexington a few years later. Exactly the same response. And we made the newspapers in Lexington, too. I mean, they never identified us. Uh, but we could tell by looking at the newspaper accounts the next day, we knew where they had flown, of course, uh, by the reports, the neighborhoods that the reports came out. We knew we, could, we were tracking our, our balloon across Lexington. Finally, one of them came down, and we launched quite a few. One of them came down in a McDonald's parking lot, and uh, the Lexington police put out the word that they were no longer amused. And that ended our UFO attack. <laughs> so I've been a great skeptic ever since. Now, uh, several years ago, about 20 years ago, Franklin became uh, much more conscious and aware of the Mantell story. Some time had passed. And uh, the decision was made to tell that story and to commemorate it with one of the Kentucky Historical Society's highway markers. This was the result. Do you see anything unusual about this highway marker? Yep. State seal is not. There is no state seal on it, and it does not say Kentucky Historical Society at the bottom. The people in the Frankfurt contacted the lady who was then running uh, that program, said, we want to do this marker. And she absolutely refused. She said the Kentucky Historical Society is not having anything to do with flying saucers and UFOs. No, we will not put up this mark. Well, the local folks were determined. They contacted uh, a gentleman who was historian for the Kentucky National Guard. He took a great interest in it. He called up the company who makes those highway markers and said, hey, can you make us one with this text on it without the state seal? They said, fine, no problem. And that's what they did. And they put up this marker uh, to Captain Mantell right at exit 2 um, on 31W and I-65, oh, about three miles from where the airplane went down. And it's a, it's a good account of what happened to him. This is the piece of the Mantell airplane that was recovered uh, after the crash. Like I say, I, I think that the Air Force's cleanup effort after this was a little casual, certainly by, by modern standards of how these things are, are done. Well, let's see where I'm There's Mantell in the center. Uh, it has been, the, what, so what's all this matter? Uh, what's important about Mantell in this episode? Uh, it has been said that the Mantell episode altered public perception of UFOs. Before this episode, people have been pretty amused by it. They thought it was kind of funny. What are these funny things? But the way this was pitched and, and told in the press, people came to see flying saucers as a threat. And to an extent, they are still seen that way today. They're shiny. A couple of months ago, the Simpson County Historical Society had his grandsons uh, make a presentation, one uh, digitally and the other in person. They are obviously very interested in the story of their grandfather, and they want to see him remembered, as do I. Um, they, uh, uh, the county judge and the mayor declared uh, Mantell, Thomas Mantell Day in Simpson County. And they brought in the witnesses, the people who were little kids in 1948, uh, who were there, and they told their stories, their recollections of what they thought had happened. Uh, they talked about the neighbors uh, covered the body with Mantell's parachute. They said that people had seen the plane coming down as far away as Portland and Orlando and even Middleton. Uh, and they talked about, they were just amazed at little kids, hundreds of people who showed up uh, to, to look at the scene of this. They said that there were ruts in the ground in that barnyard for years where the Air Force equipment came in, bulldozers and such, pulling, uh, loading up 
uh, all the wreckage. Um, oh, and, and one of them remembered some kids playing with one of his boots lying beside the airplane. And they, they talked about seeing the tail and remembering that it had gone to Western. And boy, I really wish somebody could find that. Uh, here's what I want to do. Uh, I want to play on a pole. I want an F-51 painted up like Mantell's uh, at exit two, a few miles from, from where he went down. I think the people of Simpson County are missing a tourism bet on this. And I'm working on it. Now it has to be approached carefully. <laughs> it, it could be overdone, as we have seen in uh, uh, Roswell, New Mexico. But, you know, they're, they're, they're making a buck off of it. And I believe we can find, we Kentuckians can find a tactful, tasteful, appropriate way to commemorate this, this episode. Because uh, Mantel uh, did his job, did exactly what he was supposed to do. Now, there is an aspect of the story that I've been looking at <coughs> too lately. Uh, supposedly, Sergeant Blackwell, the sergeant that was in the control tower, told the family in the 1960s, 20-some years after the episode, that he remembered Mantell as he was ascending, chasing the whatever it was, to send two of the planes, telling two of the planes to go to Standiford, get ammunition in their guns, because he wanted to approach this thing with hot guns. And uh, supposedly, they followed up on that. Interestingly, the sergeant did not put that story in his original account when he was interviewed right after the episode back in 1948. And I recently was looking closely at this photograph of one wing of Mantell's airplane. What do you see right there? Empty. No guns. This is what an F-51 looks like when it's armed. Um, those planes weren't armed. Had they gone back to Standiford Field, it wasn't just a matter of loading ammunition, which would have taken a long time, because I can assure you there was a good deal of paperwork that would have been involved in that. Um, but it was, a, it was a pretty complex little operation. Would have taken a long, long, long time, much longer than you could have expected this uh, strange device to stood around, hung around. Um, there are lots of stories and myths came out of this. Uh, I think a lot of them missed the point that Mantell seriously believed that whatever it was he was chasing, and he did not know what it was he was chasing, was a threat to his country. His job as an Air Force pilot was to defend the country against exactly that kind of threat. And that's what he was doing you know, when his plane <coughs> fell out of the sky. Well, lots of stories developed about this thing that kind of overlooked that aspect of it. Uh, the, the UFO has been described as a Soviet missile. It's a Cold War episode of uh, A spacecraft that shot Mantell down when he got too close. That's a very popular version. It has been said that Mantell's body was riddled with bullets. It wasn't. That the body was missing. It wasn't. And that the plane disintegrated in the air. It did. And was radioactive. It wasn't. Um, there was one suggestion that this was indeed a balloon. Uh, somebody wrote to one of the newspapers he was sure uh, he could identify it because they turned loose a lot of balloons a few days later at the Orange Bowl. He was certain this, this was one of them. Uh, for a long time, there was no account of one of those skyhook balloons being flown that day. Recently, one has come to light. Uh, one was released uh, in Ohio that fits the time and the place just about perfectly. Oh, uh, go down to the Simpson County Historical Society in Franklin. Uh, they have a nice little exhibit 
about this now. But uh, uh, I'd like to, I'd like to like to have more. Um, oops, I guess I'm done. Uh, the UFO was real. There was something there. We don't know exactly what it was. Uh, I don't believe it was an alien spacecraft that, that shot him down, but it was something. Mantell was an American hero, doing his duty as he saw it. And really, this is one of the biggest events in the history of Simpson County. What else has happened down there that people still talk about to this day, other than my being born in 1950? <laughs> And that weird 1968 invasion of the, the, the flying saucers. I think it all deserves to be remembered and it deserves commemoration. Questions, comments, snide remarks? Boy, do I get off that easy? Yes, sir. Those gliders that he was pulling, were they like, like disposable gliders? Or did, or did they Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> okay, just one, one yeah. time. I, Russell, they never intended to reuse those, did they? There was no real way to recover them. Oh, they, they, they landed in the middle of fields, uh, wherever they could find an open spot, one hole. Come and, apart landing, too. Yeah, yeah, a lot of them uh, crashed and came to pieces. It was gutsy. They used a lot of them. Yes, Mr. Harris? Why didn't all of the F-51s have oxygen? Because it was the post-war Air Force, and there was lots of stuff that just wasn't up to, wasn't up to stuff. They weren't ready. They weren't ready. Yeah. Same as, uh, you know, I was sort of surprised when I saw the, in the photos that there were no guns on those airplanes. <coughs> it makes perfect sense. The uh, armorers, the guys that had to take care of those guns, they're perfectly happy to have them locked in a locker somewhere. They didn't want them. Yeah, they were on a train mission. They were, they were pretty sure there were not going to be any Soviet bombers over Georgia or Tennessee that day. Uh, so why not leave them locked up? Why get them out in the, in the weather? Might rain them. Did the family receive any compensation that the uh, plane landed on the farm? Oh, they landed on the farm? No. Uh, by the way, the uh, Army, uh, the, uh, the Air Force, uh, in, at the end of their uh, investigation, uh, they published a report in 1950 that said that he let, died in the line of duty. And uh, so the family was eligible for whatever compensation. But not, not the people who landed. Never, never heard anything. Come on down, I'll take you out there. Someday. I try not to bother the people that live there, though, because you know, they could be a little bit touch us about it. Thank you all very much. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Vicki, and yes, thank you for uh, attending tonight. Uh, keep in mind next month, July 27th at 6 o'clock at Morrison Park. And uh, I think uh, we videotaped this and we'll have that uh, over on EPB Channel 6. Shortly, and so you can enjoy it again. And, and key dry cleaners open at seven. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and, and I'm sure none of you people would actually do that, now would you? You're all mature adults. I expect to hear a Glasgow young. <laughs> Thank y'all.